Welcome. We're continuing our series called Counterculture this morning, and last week we started on the topic of healthy church culture, but we didn't have enough time to get through all the points that I had prepared, so I said that we would finish that up this week. That's what we're doing. This is part two of healthy church culture. So the first half of the message is available on our website and on Facebook and our YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff, in case you missed it. Um, but I'm going to do a quick recap today just to kind of establish a little bit of context, what we're talking about. But before we do that, let's just say a word of prayer. God, we want to invite your presence and your power into this time. God, as we surrender to your word and to your spirit, we ask that you would draw us. We can't even come unless you draw us. So draw us close to you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. God, this is your house. We are your people. And so we're just asking you to have your way with all that we do here this morning, including this message, and our hearts and, and ability to receive this. In Jesus' name, amen. So we kind of base this message off of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. So I want to look at those real quick again. The Great Commandment is all about love. That's the priority of the church. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. There's our priority. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Great Commission is just about, you know, the function of the church. What is the function supposed? What is the church supposed to do? How do, how do we function? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. So, love and disciple, discipleship should drive church culture. That's kind of the basis of all of this, and. Uh, last week, I introduced you to, to five different points, five different things that are required uh, in order for us to have healthy church culture, and uh, we got through the first three, so I'm just going to quickly touch on those, kind of remind you and set context if you weren't here, and then we'll get to the other two. So the first one was trust. <coughs> we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, 7, which says, love always trusts, and we talked about the tension that that passage can create because, you know, if we think about that realistically, how do you always trust everyone when we know darn well that most people aren't trustworthy most of the time? So we talked about that. We spent some time on that last week, but uh, really just an oversimplified summary of that is that um, love always looks for the best in other people. That's an oversimplified summary of what that means. And the second thing that healthy church choir, choir? <laughs> healthy church culture requires, skipped a few <laughs> syllables there, <laughs> is clarity. Um, God is a God of order. He's a God of clarity. And that doesn't mean everything's going to be clear and orderly for us, right? We do our best to make that so, especially in ministry. It's, it's not always clear. It's not always orderly, but we do our best to make it that way. Um, we, we keep in mind that the Bible says that where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. So where there are no people, things are orderly, of course, because there's nothing to mess it up. Um, but, you know, we can't control things, and that's actually a good thing because it forces us to be dependent on God. And whether we recognize it or not, we are dependent on God, so it's a good thing to realize that. It's a good thing to think that way and live that way. The, the part of clarity that we can't do without is we actually depend on God to speak to us about our calling what are we supposed to do? We, we need God. We're dependent on God for that. And for that, we learn how to walk in the Spirit. Then the third thing that healthy culture requires is ownership. On the one hand, um, we take responsibility 
for what God has called us to and what he's gifted us to do. And there's some pretty strong warnings in the Bible about kind of blowing that off. You know, we looked at the example of the, the parable of the talents, and it's pretty scary if you, if you blow off that responsibility. But on the other hand, we don't take ownership in the sense that we think it belongs to us. You know, we need to remember that uh, we're just being good stewards of what God has given us. And in reality, everything belongs to God. It's his. And we're just, we're just taking care of whatever it is he gave us. Uh, then we talked about some spiritual warfare stuff, and that's what actually made us run out of time. So let's pick up where we left off and look at the last two points in the, in the healthy culture. The fourth one is healthy church culture requires accountability. Yay, accountability. <laughs> Even though I think we all kind of know that this is important, I have some really strong opinions about how accountability works and how it doesn't work. And uh, I believe that it can be a really powerful thing if you understand what it's for. You know, I often say that, that accountability is just a mirror. You know, it shows you what's going on. If you look in the mirror and see that you have spinach in your teeth and you get the spinach out of your teeth, then the mirror has done its job. But actually, even if you don't, the mirror has done its job, right? It's a limited, but it's a powerful tool. Um, but you know, the most important thing, the most imp important qualifier for accountability actually working is you have to want to do the right thing. You, there, there has to be something in you that desires to do the, to, to do the right thing. Because after all, that's what accountability is for, right? It's intended to, to help keep us on the right track. Now, we'd probably all say, yeah, I, I want to do the right thing. You know, we would all say that, and we probably all mean that. We probably actually do want to do the right thing most of the time. But there's parts of us that want other things. There's parts of us that don't want to do the right thing. And, and, the, and the problem with that is that that happens in our heart and we don't realize it. We want things that God doesn't want for us and we don't know that we want those things. The heart is deceptive, Scripture says. Now, this is where accountability can be very, very powerful. If you really want to know what's in there, accountability can show you. But you have to want to know. You have to want to know. I think it's Proverbs 9.9 9 says that, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Well, how do you instruct the wise? Um, especially how do you instruct the wise in such a way uh, that they can receive what you're communicating? Because we are proud people. We don't always want to know. And we certainly don't like it when other people point things out, right? Accountability is hard. We don't want other people pointing out bad things in us. So how do we instruct people that want that in such a way that makes it as easy as possible for them to receive? Well, this chart is a great way to help us think about this. On the left, we see that we can be honest or dishonest with people when we hold them accountable, right? On the bottom, we see that we can either dishonor them or we can honor them in this process. So let's look at the results of each quadrant. First one is we're dishonest and we're dishonoring. Nothing good comes from this. This is worst case scenario. All this leads to is lies and pain. This is what happens when people just don't really 
care about anyone but their self. You know, they'll say whatever is convenient in the moment or whatever gets them their way. They're not going to be honest. They're just going to brush past the truth because it's the easiest thing. And if they do happen to honor you, it's, it's because probably for the same reasons, just to get their way or whatever. They're not going to honor you to bless you. They're not honoring you out of love. But if we are dishonest but add honor in, well, that means relationship is more important than truth. It's a lot better than the first box, but you're still not going to grow. You're still not going to be able to uh, point out kind of hidden issues in someone if you're not honest with them. This is invitation without challenge. And they may feel loved, um, but we pretty much miss out on the whole point of accountability, right? Now, maybe, maybe it's hard for them to be honest because they just hate confrontation. But you can't have healthy culture without accountability. You may affo- avoid conflict that way, but, but that's never the goal, as, w- as we'll see in a moment. So what if we're honest, but we don't honor people? Well, then we're telling them that truth is more important than relationship. There's challenge, but there's no invitation. Do you ever hear the saying, I think it goes, um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. See, it's, it's hard to receive from someone if you don't think they love you, if you don't think they care, if you, if you don't think they have your best interest in mind. Truth without relationship, without loving relationship, um, feels like something you need to defend yourself from. It feels like attack. It feels like the wrong kind of confrontation. So you're not going to be able to receive truth that way. Remember, we're talking about how do we hold people accountable in a way that makes it as easy as possible for them to receive it. Well, you can't beat someone over the head with the truth and then expect them to say, thank you. Thank you. May I have another? I don't even know where that's from. (laughs) But when we're honest and honoring, then we speak the truth in love. This is invitation and challenge. And this is where scripture tells us to live. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. See, and and mature body here is just another way of saying healthy culture. This is how we get healthy culture. This is the kind of accountability that we want at Renovate. Invitation and challenge. It's where we love people enough to do the hard thing and speak the truth about something that we see in them. But we do it in such a way that makes them feel like they belong and like they're loved. I just feel like I should do a little rabbit trail here. Maybe you don't feel like you belong. Maybe you don't feel loved. Well, if that's you, if you feel that way, then here's a great opportunity to practice what I'm talking about here. Let's hold those feelings accountable. You see, in order to feel love, in order to feel belonging, It actually requires this process. This is a progressive process. Let's look at this. Trust leads to clarity. Clarity leads to ownership. And ownership needs to flow into accountability. So let me ask you, do you trust the people around you? See, I've already decided that I'm going to see the best in you. I'm going to look for the best in you. I'm going to trust you in that way. Do you trust me? 
that way? Do you see the best in me? Do you see the best in the people around you? Clarity. Do you have clarity about what we're about at Renovate? Does it make sense, love and discipleship? We sure talk a lot about it. But are you locking arms with the people around you in order to live that? In order to live the great commission and the great commandment? Do you take ownership of that in the right way? Because if you do these things, you will feel loved and you will feel that you belong. And you know what? You'll also be able to help others to feel like they're loved and that they belong. Healthy culture requires this kind of accountability where we think through and we speak the truth even to ourselves. That's required. I mean, that is actually required. You may say, well, what if we don't have unhealthy culture, but I mean, unhealthy accountability? What if we just don't have accountability? No, no. It requires healthy accountability. It's the same thing with the next point, our last point. We actually require healthy conflict. Uh, That feels a little counterintuitive. I mean, wouldn't it be better just to have no conflict? Well, I'd say in theory, maybe that's true, but it's impossible, so it's a moot point. No conflict is not possible among humans. Why? Because humans are fallen. We're fallen. For example, we're, we're inherently selfish. Well, you put two inherently selfish people in a room and there's going to be conflict, right? Right? Of course, yes. We will always experience conflict with other people. And that might seem like a real bummer. You mean we got to deal with that for the rest of our lives, this side of heaven? We're always going to have to deal with that? Yeah. But you know what? You shouldn't let that discourage you Discourage you, because <clears throat> actually there's a beautiful silver lining to that truth. God in his infinite wisdom He uses even that for our good. In fact, conflict, rightly handled, is one of the most powerful tools available for spiritual development for us. If you rightly handle conflict, that will make you grow, period. Otherwise, it won't be healthy anymore. Healthy conflict will always make you grow. Why? Because it exposes areas in our life where we need to grow. If that stuff is hidden, conflict brings it to the surface. Healthy conflict helps us grow. Is it uncomfortable? Cha? Absolutely. But you know what? Without it, we stay stagnant. We, we stay stuck in our junk. But conflict brings movement. And movement is required for health. Think about that. In all of life, movement is required for health. If you have a pond and there's no movement in that water... It's going to become stagnant. It's going to stink. It's just going to be nasty, right? If you have no movement in your body, your muscles will atrophy. If you have no movement in your brokenness, if that's never stirred, you will stay stuck. You will stay stagnant in that. Now, it's much easier to not have conflict, right, in the short term. Just like it's, it's easier to not exercise in the short term. But you know what? In the long run, that's a huge problem. 
right? Healthy bodies require movement. Healthy culture requires movement. So listen to me. Do not avoid conflict. Don't run from it. Don't avoid talking to people. Don't avoid dealing with it because you will stay stagnant. And and to be honest with you, you will eventually fade away. You won't make it. Deal with it. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing in disguise. If you deal with it rightly, if you deal with it in the way that we're describing here, it will be a blessing to you. Because healthy culture requires movement, just like healthy bodies require movement. Not just any kind of movement, though. (laughs) Right? Because the wrong kind of movement physically can injure you. It's the same thing with accountability and culture. The wrong kind of movement that way can injure you, sometimes literally. So what's the right kind of movement? concerning healthy church culture? What's the right kind of movement in conflict? Well, we can come from two different perspectives with this. We can come at it with the perspective of correction, which is healthy, it's good, it bears good fruit, or we can come at it from the angle of condemnation, which which brings shame, which is destructive, which causes you to hide and be broken. So let's look at both of those next to each other and some of the results that take place. With correction, we're developed by words rather than damaged by them. Correction makes me feel loved. Condemnation makes me feel shamed. Correction draws me close. Condemnation pushes me away. Correction makes me hopeful. Condemnation makes me fearful. With correction, I learn a better way. With condemnation, I just think I'm bad. Again, the shame, the thinking I'm bad, that's a well-researched fact that it's destructive. That's, that's in the Bible, that's in psychology. With correction, I develop greater confidence. With condemnation, I develop deeper insecurity. With correction, I become more responsive. With condemnation, I become more defensive. With correction, I grow. With condemnation, I hide. Isn't that powerful? So listen, when you have conflict with somebody, don't condemn. Don't condemn. Don't fall into that trap. Be very careful to walk in love as you're dealing with whatever that situation is, whether that's your spouse, a coworker, friendship, your kids. Listen, teach your kids healthy conflict by example because that's the only way they're going to learn. However you're dealing with it in front of them, that's their lesson from you. Teach them how to do it right. You know, oftentimes when we're in relationship with people that we don't quite know yet, we have to earn trust before we can, you know, remember the progression there? We need to earn their trust before, you know, before they'll be able to receive correction from you. So don't just walk up to a stranger and go, I think God's telling me that you're a sinner and you need to get your act together. Probably not the best idea then like when you're on the receiving end of this, don't receive condemnation. You know, if somebody's goal is just to tear you a new one, give you a piece of their mind and set the record straight, whatever, you don't need to receive that. Just do this. But I I say that with a very strong warning, okay? Please hear this. Be very careful not to perceive correction as condemnation. Because oftentimes people can 
bring correction in the right way, in the most loving way possible, and we can still perceive it as condemnation. Because it's not easy to hear what you're doing wrong, is it? But listen, if you're not teachable, you are not a disciple. If you're not teachable, the devil has won. Disciple means learner. How can you learn without changing what you know? You have to receive new information to grow. So if you're defensive, you won't receive that. Make sense? At the heart of this, you know, um, conflict, what, what is it really about? Well, conflict is the result of our will being thwarted. Think about it. I mean, can you think of any example where there's conflict happening and it's not a result of your will being thwarted or the other person's will being thwarted? That's what it is. Well, you know what? Sometimes your will needs to be thwarted. Sometimes it doesn't. And it takes great wisdom at times to know what's what. For example, if, if someone wants to hurt my wife, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be a fight. And you know what? There should be. That's appropriate, isn't it? But if the issue is simply that somebody is thwarting what benefits or bothers you? If the issue is, well, they're just irritating. Oh, they didn't say hi to me when I walked past them in the cafe. Or this or that, you know. If it's something like that, that is not worth a fight. Is it conflict? Yes, but it should be healthy conflict. But there shouldn't be a fight over that. You know what? That's actually what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about turn the other cheek. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Remember that? If you really study that, what that is talking about is if it's just a matter of somebody thwarting your expectations or of offending you or something like that, turn the other cheek to them. Go the extra mile with them. How dare you ask me to carry your coat? Carry it an extra mile. But it's not, Jesus isn't saying let them hurt your wife, okay? Or let them, let them hurt you. That's not what this is talking about. Jesus, I could, I could go into this. There's lots of other places where it's obvious Jesus was not like this absolute pacifist. That's silly. See, what this boils down to is healthy conflict should be based on God's best for the other person, for you, and for the group as a whole. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's not even all about the community. If we have to say it's all about, it's all about him. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But if we keep those three things in mind, me, you, and us, then we'll have a healthy view of this. And these tools are a great way for us to, to navigate this. So there it is, five things that are required for healthy church culture, trust, clarity, ownership, accountability, and healthy conflict. <clears throat> Let me just say, this isn't just for church culture. This is any culture. When I say church, I'm talking about the people of God. This is what the the people of God are called to trust, clarity, ownership, accountability, and healthy conflict. Kind of looks like a Christmas tree, doesn't it? Especially if I do that. <laughs> 
Christmas in March, anyone? No, too soon. <laughs> How about we call this our culture tree? This is our culture tree. Maybe that'll help us remember this message and remember these five points.